All right, you can see my main slides, yes. right? Not my presentation. Okay, great. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't know if I, I'll try to keep it in, uh, within 25 minutes. It shouldn't take like way longer than that, uh, uh, but we'll just see how it goes. Uh, so uh, just to sort of give a little bit more background of, of uh, kind of myself and what it is, what it is that I do specifically, um, I have a very interdisciplinary background. So I have, you know, a bachelor's in neuroscience, uh, the master's, you know, the, in cognition and uh, in IT, um, and then the PhD, it was done uh, in computer science with a focus on natural language processing. So I kind of have like a little bit of, of an interdisciplinary background. Um, in this paper, the focus is on statistical machine translation. Um, I don't work on machine translation myself, but I'll try to sort of um, just keep it very uh, approachable for everyone, even if uh, you don't know much about uh, statistical machine translation. Um, but before uh, I sort of dive into the paper, um, I just want to sort of outline the, the way that I'm going to go through uh, what the paper does and also in terms of the um, sort of more general uh, context of the of the field. Um, so this paper is is uh, is quite important and I want to sort of motivate the choice uh, for uh, why we kind of decided to read this paper. Um, then I want to sort of talk a little bit of preliminary on RNNs and I think you know given the the technical background of, of this grad, I expect that this is not uh, something new but uh, it, it is also something that is discussed on the paper so it's sort of uh, flows well with that. Um, then I want to uh, just give a very um, uh, brief overview of uh, the differences between GRUs and LSTMs because um, in this paper, um, even though they don't call it uh, a gated uh, recurrent unit, um, that's really what the architecture that they're presenting, right? So now we know GRUs, they're used uh, quite often. Um, and this is the paper that presents them, uh, that uh, sort of um, uh, introduces them. Um, then I wanna talk a little bit more, you know, uh, about the experiments um, that Cho presents, and then we can sort of dive into the discussion. Um, so first of all, let's just briefly talk about uh, why uh, this paper uh, is important. So if we sort of look at the neural history of natural language processing, um, in 2001, you have uh, Joshua Bengio uh, in, presenting a paper where, where they, this is kind of the first paper that introduces neural language modeling. Um, so language modeling, uh, it, it's basically the task of, of uh, uh, learning or, you know, providing a, a probability for a, a sequence of words, right? Um, and this is used in uh, speech processing and a lot of uh, language technologies. Um, but this was sort of the first paper that showed that you could sort of model this using neural networks, uh, predicting a word based on the context, right? Um, and this is really kind of the, the beginning of, uh, of how we do uh, natural language processing now. Um, but the paper that we're discussing today um, is really, I would say like one of the first ones that sort of falls into this uh, very important moment in the history of NLP, uh, which is uh, sequence to sequence modeling. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the reason why this is sort of uh, <laughs> really important is because uh, in natural language processing, you have a lot of problems that, uh, uh, where you have to generate language, right? So I think a lot of the, uh, the early natural language processing uh, problems have been um, in terms of text classification. Uh, so you didn't really have this, uh, yeah, uh, sequence to sequence uh, uh, way of formulating the problems. Um, but uh, once you sort of start trying to do more complex things, generating, for example, dialogue generation or abstractive uh, summarization, uh, simplification of text, uh, um, a lot of the times, you know, you could sort of frame this as a, gener a natural language generation problem. Um, and it's the same with, with machine translation, right? You're sort of 
you would like to, in the end, you would like to generate a sequence of words. Um, so sequence to sequence is, is uh, problems are, are, are very common, um, but before, you know, 2014, there was a really a good way of dealing with this. Um, there are some uh, deep uh, neural network architectures that allowed you to sort of output a sequence, but um, you were not really able to um, output uh, sequences of, of different sizes, you know, you needed to sort of know the, the, uh, the length of the sequences in advance to be able to sort of do this, right? So this is one of the motivations uh, of Cho. So being able to sort of model variable length sequences. Um, but one of the, um, the, the big motivations is really, you know, to improve race-based uh, uh, statistical machine translation. Um, so even though this paper introduces the encoder-decoder um, architecture, it's not, they don't really use it in the way that it's used now or that it, it got used later, right? We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, some neural networks, they sort of allow you to um, predict sequences, but um, before the encoder decoder architectures, um, you really can, you needed to know um, the, the length of the sequence. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next uh, few slides, but uh, in this paper, the way that uh, the, the RNNs that are used are what now we know as the gated recurrent unit. Um, and this is, uh, Again, this is a really important work and it's kind of concurrent work to this other paper. Um, I think I have included a link uh, in the slides at the end, but if not, I'll double check. Uh, but this paper is uh, essentially another uh, really important RNN encoder decoder um, architecture, uh, but instead of using the GRU, um, they use the kind of uh, the standard LSTM. I, I can't find my cursor. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's sort of, you know, just briefly uh, putting this paper in the context of, of uh, neural NLP. Um, so before we sort of get uh, into what is like the GRU that Cho, present, that Cho presents and, and the experiments, um, let's just briefly talk about the RNN. Um, so the RNN is really just a generalization of the feed forward neural network, um, but it's able to sort of handle sequential information, right? So given some variable length sequence, um, the hidden state of the RNN will be updated um, at each time step by sort of taking in the, the sort of memory, the hidden state of the previous uh, time step, um, and then the uh, vector representation of the current, uh, of the input at the current time step, um, then feeding those through some nonlinear activation function. Um, and that's sort of the updated uh, hidden state, right? Um, and this nonlinear activation function um, can be really, you know, a, a logistic sigmoid function, or it could be something more, more complex, right? Um, and essentially, you know, the RNNs are able to sort of learn a probability distribution over a sequence by learning uh, to predict the, the next item uh, in the sequence, right? Um, and the output of the RNN will be a, um, a distribution that, uh, that can be sort of, yeah, it, it's the output of, of a softmax um, activation function. Um, so if we sort of look at uh, in a graphical uh, representation, uh, so essentially, you know, the RNN is going to process a sequence of vectors one by one. And then here you could sort of see, I don't know if you could see my cursor. Maybe I can um, use the point, the laser pointer. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, the, at each time step, you will output the hidden state right here, feed it into the next time step. Um, and then you also get as input the um, current vector. So if we sort of take a look at, uh, you know, one of these, let's say uh, 
the second one right here. Uh, we could sort of see in more detail what's happening. Um, let me get rid of this. I don't like it, <laughs> the laser pointer. All right, so here we could see a little bit better what's happening, right? So you would get the hidden state of the previous, um, uh, at the previous time step. And then you would sort of get the um, input uh, at the current time, time step. Um, and then you have some concatenation operation here. Um, and then you feed that uh, through this hyperbolic tangent function, which is um, able to map the, um, the values uh, between negative one and one and sort of that, that sort of uh, regulates the output. Um, and then that is fed into the next, um, uh, to the next time step. Um, so that will look something like this. So then you kind of just feed it into the next one and then you sort of continue. Um, and the hidden state, you know, it, it sort of acts as a memory because it's sort of able to hold information from the, up to the previous time step, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so I think many of you uh, probably know this, but uh, RNNs tend to sort of um, fail when it comes to long-term dependencies. So um, in theory, you know, RNNs should be able to, to remember um, information that, that they've seen uh, from a very long time. But I think, you know, where they fail is more of, in terms of, of, uh, compute, of the computations that they do. Um, so, you know, these sort of computations, they use finite precision uh, numbers. So when you do, when you're training a vanilla RNN using backpropagation, um, the gradients that are sort of, they're backpropagated, um, they can vanish. So they can become uh, closer and closer to zero or they can become very large, right? But essentially uh, when you have very small gradient updates, the, the um, model will stop learning, right? And, and typically um, the, the earlier layers are the ones that, that will sort of stop learning. And this is sort of how you have this kind of long-term uh, memory problems with, uh, with vanilla RNNs, right? Um, and then this is the reason why you have things such as uh, LSTMs. And in this paper, you have the GRU. Um, and these essentially have, are equipped with mechanisms to uh, sort of mitigate or to sort of um, uh, figure out what to learn and what to, what, or what to keep, what to forget. So let's just uh, talk a little bit about, you know, the differences between these, because I think, um, so I will start with the LSTM because uh, the GRU uh, proposed by Cho, um, it's really, you know, inspired by the LSTM. And I think, you know, again, uh, this is uh, stuff that you probably are familiar with, uh, but it's really important sort of to understanding the, the motivation of, of the paper. Um, so if we sort of look at, uh, if we remember kind of the general flow of the RNN, um, the LSTM will follow the same flow, but inside the, the uh, cell, um, we have different operations, right? Um, so here, instead of just having this hyperbolic tan function, tangent function, um, we have the different gates uh, as well, right? We have some sigmoid uh, operations um, in order to sort of uh, help the model figure out what to, information to forget, what information to remember. Um, and then also, you know, you have uh, these two outputs, right? So you in, in the LSTM, it's pretty um, normal to have a cell state and a hidden state. And they kind of encode some similar information, but they're, um, uh, but yeah, the cell state is sort of uh, kind of just uh, regulating the uh, forget and, and the uh, what to input, right? Um, so basically, you know, here you would have the same uh, input at the time step and then the hidden state. Um, and the sigmoid function, what it does, it just maps the values between zero and one. So zero uh, means that you completely forget some information. 
and one is you know that it's important right and then you have the input gate saying um, it does something similar so it's just uh, sort of uh, regulating what information to keep um, and then the output gate is just uh, uh, the sort of regulating what uh, goes into the hidden um, the hidden state mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. All right, so the gated recurrent unit, um, so it's inspired by the LSTMs. Um, it does also have uh, these gates, but you get rid of the cell state because in reality, I mean, it's redundant. Uh, uh, the, the cell state is, it carries some similar information to the hidden state. So um, here the, you have the update and the reset gate. Um, so the reset gate, essentially, you know, it sort of uh, learns what information to forget. Um, and the update gate um, uh, basically knows what information to, to add. And, and, uh, and then you have this, uh, uh, the hidden state uh, output right here. Um, and essentially, you know, the GRU, I think it, it tends to perform Mm, relatively similar to the LSTM in some uh, with some data sets. Um, but I think the really the cool thing about the GRU is that uh, is that uh, it requires less uh, tensor operations, right? So, so it's, it's a little bit faster. <clears throat> so in this paper, um, uh, they present the, uh, an encoder decoder architecture. So an encoder decoder, um, essentially it uh, gives us the flexibility to be able to decode um, ver a variable uh, into a variable length sequence, right? So basically the, the encoder decoder architecture is made up of two RNNs. So you have the RNN um, for the encoder portion, uh, which is uh, essentially working in the way that we just saw. Um, but then in the end, uh, so typically you have a sequence. Um, at the end of the sequence, you have an end, end of token, uh, end of sentence token. Um, and then once the, the system says, sees the end of sentence token, it will output a hidden state, which sort of um, encodes the information of that sequence. Um, then this um, uh, hidden, sta hidden state, um, will be fed into the decoder um, and then the decoder will sort of, uh, will be trained to output um, a, a new sequence um, that is sort of conditioned on this, uh, uh, the internal state of the encoder. Um, and these uh, two components are trained uh, jointly. Um, And uh, really it's like kind of the main difference between these two papers, as I've mentioned, um, is that uh, Cho uses the GRU that I mentioned uh, earlier and Sutskever et al uses the LSTN. Um, so now we can sort of, uh, I mean, that's really the, the main uh, points of the architecture that is used and sort of like how it differs from uh, from the Sutskever paper. And I think uh, the main thing is that, uh, you know, the, the unit that they're using is computationally more uh, efficient. Um, so now we can talk a little bit more in detail about the experiments. Um, so the, really the point of, of, uh, of using this encoder decoder architecture in the context of this paper is to improve uh, phrase-based statistical machine translation. So uh, this is different than what sort of came later, right? Because then later we sort of saw how they were directly using the neural model for machine translation. And that's, you know, where NMT neural machine translation sort of comes um, later down the road. But here, this is sort of the first paper that is saying, okay, we can sort of um, improve these statistical models um, by making use of this encoder-decoder architecture. Um, and in phrase-based statistical machine translation, typically you have, you know, the, um, you have maybe 
uh, pair, uh, pairs of sentences. Um, that's sort of like what your, um, your data is made up of. Um, and the task is, you know, first you need to sort of segment these into phrases. Um, and then the phrases are translated in isolation. And then maybe, you know, there will be some reordering. Um, and there are, you know, many steps to phrase-based statistical machine translation that uh, I will not uh, go into detail, but uh, um, there are, uh, in order for you to extract phrases, you need to sort of also have an alignment uh, algorithm. And then using this alignment, you then extract the phrases. Um, but in this paper, you know, uh, that's sort of not, not the point. So they're kind of using a, a Moses, something that is already kind of out there. Um, so here we're assuming that we have already gone through the steps and we have the phrases, the phrase pairs. Um, so uh, for this type of model, typically the data uh, that you use to, to learn the, the model is a table with phrase translations and their probabilities, right? Um, but in this paper, uh, the point is not really to sort of, uh, uh, again, it's not a neural machine translation model, right? It's, uh, uh, the point is really just to sort of train this encoder decoder um, on these uh, pairs of, of uh, phrases, um, but it's just so that you can sort of rescore the phrase pairs and then feed that as an additional feature into your SMT model. Um, so um, essentially, uh, first, what uh, Cho et al. are doing is that they're training the encoder decoder on the table of phrase pairs. Um, as I said, the scores are in input to the SMT. Um, and uh, basically what uh, they do insinuate in the paper is that it might be possible, they sort of uh, insinuate that it may be possible to just completely move to neural machine translation, right? But this is, this is the paper that sort of lays the foundation for that, um, but they don't do it themselves because it's uh, for computational reasons, right? Um, uh, in this paper, they use the WMT uh, 2014 data. Um, so WMT is like a pretty uh, famous, uh, I think it started as a workshop, but now it's sort of its own conference uh, uh, for machine translation. Um, uh, so they use the data from that. Um, and they basically compare different setups, right? So the first one is the baseline configuration. So just uh, they want to see how the uh, SMT model does by itself. Um, then they want to see how the SMT model does with uh, the additional scores from the RNN encoder decoder. Um, so these scores are, are basically just the probabilities, right? Uh, uh, from the, the encoder decoder architecture. Um, and then they also uh, use a language model. So as I said, the language model is, um, it gives you the, the probability of, um, of a sequence of words, right? So if a sentence is more fluent and it's more, uh, yeah, if it's more fluent, the probability uh, will, of it will be uh, higher. Right, <clears throat> um, and then they also uh, have the baseline with uh, a rescoring based on the language model, a rescoring based on the RNN encoder decoder, and then some uh, word penalty. So here, I think that they are uh, penalizing um, the words that are uh, unknown to the network. Um, and to evaluate, they use. Uh, uh, blue scores, which is essentially like this sort of um, token uh, matching uh, uh, metric. Um, so they have uh, these four um, different uh, setups. So the baseline again, baseline plus RNN encoder decoder, baseline. So this is all baseline plus, right? Uh, baseline plus language model and RNN and then with the word penalty. Um, so if we just look at the baseline, um, let's say, or just focus on the test set, uh, 
Um, the baseline alone does uh, achieves a, a blue score of uh, 33.3. Um, so when we add the RN, the scores of the RNN and encoder decoder, um, they increase. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess to me, this sort of in, uh, increase is not really, a, uh, I, it's a fundamental paper. And I think for a long time, these sort of small uh, improvements, they were really, uh, uh, you know, you were really trying to optimize for, for improving this for, uh, fraction of a uh, <laughs> percent, you know, but um, uh, I, I don't know if it, it looks uh, so significant, you know, now that I look at it, <laughs> but uh, here it's, a, uh, it's kind of a big uh, improvement. Um, when you add uh, the language modeling and the RNN, then I think I would say that that's a little bit more significant, right? Uh, um, and I think this is also something that they, they say on the paper that really the best result comes from um, uh, using the language model rescoring and the RNN encoder decoder rescoring. Um, and yeah, this is also what I, I, I would say. Uh, I would say that uh, these last two are really the, the significant improvements. Um, and uh, the model learned some uh, interesting properties. So I think this is sort of um, one of the early papers that sort of showed us um, uh, something that, uh, that now is pretty standard. I think we all kind of know, uh, know this to be true. So when you sort of learn um, uh, this type of, uh, you know, language modeling task, I guess you could uh, call it. So you sort of learn, uh, uh, you know, to predict uh, uh, some text based on some other, you know, um, sequence, um, then you're essentially learning, uh, you know, the hidden state essentially uh, is able to capture a lot of important semantic information and syntactic information. And this is also something that, uh, that was uh, presented, I think, some years before this paper in the, I think, in Mi uh, Mikolov uh, et al., um, where they sort of present, present the, the sort of the foundation for what is the war to Beck. Um, which is sort of one of the, I mean, it's essentially what uh, made word embeddings uh, super popular. Um, so these are, are uh, Cho et al, they basically find the same thing, right? Uh, by training an encoder decoder. Um, uh, so given some sequence to predict another sequence, the model is able to, to learn important uh, semantic information. Um, and this is the thing that we see also now with, with pre-trained, you know, uh, models, right? You're sort of, uh, um, specifically with language models, you're learning to, uh, to predict a word based on some context. And then you're essentially, the model is sort of implicitly uh, learning, uh, you know, what words occur together. And, and, and you could sort of see that uh, words that have, uh, similar vector or, or, you know, vectors that are close in space, um, that's because they, you know, have semantic uh, properties that are similar. And if you want to sort of read uh, a little bit more, uh, there's this extension, um, it's, a, it's also Cho, um, and it's a 2014 paper, it came right after this one, um, where they sort of discuss in more in detail um, how such an architecture can be used for neural machine translation and some of the limitations and the properties. Um, so that's, you know, essentially the, what they do in the paper. Um, but I just want to sort of, before we start um, talking about um, maybe the other aspects of the paper or, you know, any doubts, I just uh, briefly wanted to mention, you know, the relation of this paper in terms of, of newer methods. Um, and I think, you know, at the beginning, I sort of tried to put this paper in the context of like the history of, of neural NLP. Um, uh, but I think, you know, uh, it's also kind of uh, nice to think about sort of what came after and where we are now. Um, so I think, you know, uh, 
the RNN, uh, I sort of mentioned that it has some problems with, uh, with memory, right? So it's sort of uh, with the method that I uh, sh showed right now and, and then also the method that Cho uh, introduces. Uh, so this is a very traditional sequence to sequence model. And typically you, uh, you are only outputting the hidden state after you've seen the end of sequence token, right? So essentially you're outputting the hidden state there and you're discarding all of the intermediate states of the encoder. Um, so this is typically okay when you have smaller sequences, um, but when you kind of want to remember a lot more like farther back, you need some other type of mechanism, right? Um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, the the input gate, the forget gate, all of those mechanisms that the LSTM and the GRU try to use to remember information. Um, but then uh, about a year after this paper, then you start seeing a lot more of these attention mechanisms. So there are other, you know, uh, you can think of them as attention gates. <laughs> so there are mechanisms for the decoder to also be able to keep track of information from intermediate states. Um, so, you know, the, the decoder will sort of know what's important um, uh, all across the input, right? So, so they'll have a little bit more information and you typically uh, construct, you know, context vect vectors uh, that sort of keep track of this information. And, and I can add some links uh, if you want to read more about that, I probably uh, already know. Um, uh, and yeah, so I, I think right now, you know, we talked about encoder decoders and, and we talked about the RNN. Um, and I think, you know, for a really long time, this was a standard architecture and natural language processing. Um, but some years back, it got uh, demoted uh, due to the introduction of the transformer. Um, and the transformer, you know, it's, it's, uh, based solely on attention, right? Um, so it's able to sort of also uh, learn sequences, but it's actually not using recurrence. Um, it's or, it's it just uh, uses something called self-attention. And then it also has, uh, um, there's different, you know, uh, now I think the list of transformer-based models keeps growing and growing, um, but there are some models that they use, you know, positional embeddings to sort of uh, uh, learn, you know, what uh, the global dependencies between the input and the output, right? Um, and the very attractive thing about these models is that uh, because they don't use recurrence, they are highly parallelizable. So they're much more efficient. Um, and because of that, you know, we're able to use much more data. So now you kind of see these gi uh, gigantic uh, transformer models uh, that uh, train for weeks on like a TPU or something like that, <laughs> um, because you can use really that much more data, right? And they're really powerful. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the encoder decoder is really, you know, I think that's very standard uh, still. Um, but just sort of the the, um, the underlying, you know, neural architecture is, is, is slightly different, right? So now you, instead of using the RNNs, we're using the transformers. Um, so yeah, that's all. Um, and I think, you know, if I think of more papers that I mentioned, I, I could maybe add them here. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's all I have. <laughs>